Purgatory, Chapter 7 Location of Purgatory, St. Ludwina Let us narrate a third vision relating to the interior of Purgatory, that of St. Ludwina, who died April 11, 1433, and whose history, written by a contemporary priest, has the most perfect authenticity. This admirable virgin, a truly prodigy of Christian patience, was a prey to all the pains of the most cruel maladies for the period of thirty-eight years. Her sufferings rendering sleep impossible to her, she passed long nights in prayer, and then, frequently wrapped in spirit, she was conducted by her angel guardian into the mysterious regions of purgatory. There she saw dwellings, prisons, divers dungeons, one more dismal than the other. She met, too, souls that she knew, and she was shown their various punishments. It may be asked, what was the nature of those ecstatic journeys? And it is difficult to explain, but we must conclude from a certain other circumstances that there are more reality in them than we might be led to believe. The holy invalid made similar journeys and pilgrimages upon earth to the holy places in Palestine, to the churches of Rome, and to the monasteries in the vicinity. She had an exact knowledge of these places, which she had thus traversed. A religious of the monastery of St. Elizabeth, conversing one day with her, and speaking of the cells, of the chapter room, of the refectory, etc., of this community, she gave him an exact and detailed a description of his house, as though she had passed her life there. The religious having expressed his surprise, No, father, said she, that I have been through your monastery, I had visited the cells, I have seen the angel guardians of all those who occupy them. On the other journeys which our saint made to purgatory occurred as follows. An unfortunate sinner entangled in the corruption of the world was finally converted, thanks to the prayers and urgent exhortations of Lodwina. He made a sincere confession of all his sins and received absolution, but had little time to practice penance, for shortly after he died of the plague. The saint offered up many prayers and sufferings for his soul, and some time afterwards, having been taken by her guardian angel into purgatory, she desired to know if she was still there and in what condition. He is there, said her angel, and he suffers much. Would you be willing to endure some pain in order to diminish his? Certainly, she replied, I am ready to suffer anything to assist him. Instantly her guardian angel conducted her into a place of frightful torture. Is this then hell, my brother? asked the holy maiden, seized with horror. No, sister, answered the angel, but this part of purgatory is bordering upon hell. Looking around on all sides, she saw what was resembled an immense prison, surrounded with walls of prodigious height, the blackness of which, together with the monstrous stones, inspired her with horror. Approaching this dismal enclosure, she heard a confused noise of lamenting voices, cries of fury, chains, instruments of torture, of violent blows, which the executioners discharged upon their victims. This noise was such that all the torment of the world, in tempest or battle, could bear no comparison to it. What then is that horrible place? asked St. Ludwina of her good angel. Do you wish me to show it to you? No, I beseech you, she said, recoiling with terror. The noise which I hear is so frightful that I can no longer bear it. How then could I endure the sight of those horrors? Continuing her mysterious route, she saw an angel seated sadly on the curb of the well. Who is that angel? she asked of her guide. It is he, he replied, the angel guardian of the sinner in whose lot you are interested. His soul is in this well, where it has a special purgatory. At these words, Ludwina cast an inquiring glance at her angel. She desired to see that soul which was dear to her. 
and endeavor to release it from that frightful pit. Her angel who understood her, having taken off the cover of the well, a cloud of flames together with the most plaintive cries came forth. Do you recognize that voice? said the angel. Alas, yes, answered the servant of God. Do you desire to see that soul? he continued. On her replying in the affirmative, he called him by name, and immediately our virgin saw appear at the mouth of the pit a spirit all on fire, resembling incandescent metal, which said to her in a voice scarcely audible, O Ledwina, servant of God, who will give me to contemplate the face of the Most High? The sight of the soul, a prey to the most terrible torment of fire, gave our saint such a shock that the cincture which she wore around her body was rent in twain, and no longer able to endure the sight, she woke suddenly from her ecstasy. The persons present, perceiving her fear, asked her its cause. Alas, she replied, how frightful are the prisons of purgatory. It was to assist the souls that I consented to descend thither. Without this motive, if the whole world were given to me, I would not undergo the terror with which that horrible spectacle inspired. Some days later, the same angel whom had seen so dejected appeared her with a joyful countenance. He told her that the soul of his protege had left the pit and passed into the ordinary purgatory. This partial alleviation did not suffice the charity of Ludwina. She continued to pray for that poor patient and to apply to him the merits of her sufferings until she saw the gates of heaven opened to him. Purgatory, Chapter 8 According to St. Thomas and other doctors, as we have previously seen, divine justice in particular cases assigns a special place upon earth for certain souls. This opinion we have confirmed by several facts, among which we quote the two mentioned by St. Gregory the Great in his dialogues. While I was young and still a layman, I heard two of the seniors, who were well-informed men, how the deacon Pascasius appeared to Germain, bishop of Capua. Pascasius, deacon of the Apostolic See, whose books on the Holy Ghost are still extant, was a man of eminent sanctity, devoted to works of charity, zealous for the relief of the poor, and most forgetful of self. A dispute having arisen concerning a pontifical election, Pascasius separated himself from the bishop and joined the party disapproved by the episcopacy. Soon after he died, with a reputation of sanctity, which God confirmed by a miracle, an instantaneous cure was effected on the day of the funeral by the simple touch of his dalmatic. Long after this, Germain, bishop of Capua, was sent by the physicians to the baths of St. Angelo. What was his astonishment to find the same deacon, Patius, employed in the most menial offices at the baths? I here expiate, said the apparition, the wrong I did by adhering to the wrong party. I beseech of you, pray to the Lord for me. You will know that you have been heard when you shall no longer see me in these places. Germain began to pray for the deceased, and after a few days, returning to the baths, sought in vain for Patius, who had disappeared. He had but to undergo a temporary punishment, says St. Gregory, but he had sinned through ignorance and not through malice. The same pope speaks of a priest of Santucella, now Civita Vecchia, who also went to the warm baths. A man presented himself to serve him in the most menial offices, and for several days waited upon him with the most extreme kindness and even eagerness. The good priest, thinking that he ought to reward so much attention, came the next day with two loaves of blessed bread, and after having received the unusual assistance of his kind servant, offered him the loaves. 
The servant with a sad countenance replied, Why, father, do you offer me this bread? I cannot eat it. I, whom you see, was formerly the master of this place, and after my death I was sent back to the condition in which you see me for the expiation of my faults. If you wish to do me good, ah, uh, offer up the bread of the Eucharist. At these words he suddenly disappeared, and he whom the priest had thought to be a man showed by vanishing that he was but a spirit. For a whole week the good priest devoted himself to works of penances, and each day offered up the sacred host in the favor of the departed one. Then, having returned to the same baths, no longer found his faithful servant, and concluded that he had been delivered. It seems that divine justice sometimes condemns souls to undergo their punishment in the same place where they have committed their sins. We read in the Chronicles of the Friars Minors that the Blessed Stephen, religious of that order, had a similar devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, so that he passed part of the night in adoration before it. On one occasion, being alone in the chapel, the darkness broken by the faint glimmer of the little lamp, he suddenly perceived a religious in one of the stalls. Stephen approached him and asked if he had permission to leave his cell at such an hour. I am a deceased religious, he replied, here by a decree of God's justice. I must undergo my purgatory, because I have sinned by tepidity and negligence at the divine office. The Lord permits me to make known my state to you, that you may assist me by your prayers. Touched with these words, Blessed Stephen immediately knelt down to recite the De Profundus and other prayers, and he noticed that whilst he prayed, the features of the deceased bore an expression of joy. Several times during the following nights, he saw the apparition in the same manner, but more happy each time as it approached the term of its deliverance. Finally, after the last prayer of Blessed Stephen, it arose all radiant from the stall, expressed its gratitude to its liberator, and disappeared in the brightness of glory. The following incident is so marvelous that we should hesitate to reproduce it, says Canon Postel, had it not been narrated by the Father Theophilus Rinald, theologian and controversialist, who relates it as an event which happened in his time and almost under his very eyes. The Abbe Levé adds that the vicar general of the Archbishop of Vesquion, after having examined the details, recognized its truth. In the year 1629, at Dole, in France, Comte, Huguet Roy, a woman of the middle station in life, was confined to bed by inflammation of the lungs, which endangered her life. The physician considered it necessary to bleed her, and his awkwardness cut the artery in the left arm, which speedily reduced her to the last extremity. The following day, at dawn, she entered into her chamber a young girl clad in white, of most modest deportment, who asked her if she was willing to accept her services and to be nursed by her. The sick woman delighted with her offer, answered that nothing could give her the greater pleasure, and instantly the stranger lighted at the fire, approached Huguet, and placed her gently on the bed, and then continued to watch her and serve her like the most devoted infirmarian. But, oh wonder, contact with the hands of the unknown, one was so beneficial that the dying person found herself greatly relieved, and soon felt entirely cured. Then she would absolutely know who the admirable stranger was, and called her that she might question her. But she withdrew, saying that she would return in the evening. In the meantime, astonishment and curiosity were extreme when the tidings of this sudden cure spread abroad, and nothing was spoken in the dole but this mysterious event. When the unknown visitor returned in the evening, she said to Huguet, without trying to disguise herself, Know, my dear niece, that I am your aunt, Leonarde Colon, 
who died seventeen years ago, leaving you an inheritance from her little property. Thanks to the divine bounty, I am saved. But it was the Blessed Virgin, to whom I had great devotion, who obtained for me this happiness. Without her I was lost. When death suddenly struck me, I was in the state of mortal sin. But the merciful Virgin Mary obtained for me perfect contrition, and thus saved me from eternal damnation. Since that time I am in purgatory, and Our Lady permits me to finish my expiation by serving you during fourteen days. At the end of that time I shall be delivered from my pains if, on your part, you have the charity to make three pilgrimages for me to the three holy sanctuaries of the Blessed Virgin. Huguette, astonished, knew not what to think of this language, not being able to believe the reality of the apparition, and fearing some snare of the evil spirit, she consulted her confessor. Father Anthony Rowland, a Jesuit, who advised her to threaten the unknown person with the exorcism of the church. This menace did not disturb her. She replied tranquilly that she feared not the prayers of the church. They have no power, she added, but against the demons and the damned. None whatever against predestined souls, who are in the grace of God as I am. Huguette was not yet convinced. How, she said to the young girl, can you be my Aunt Leonarde, who was old and worn, disagreeable and whimsical, whilst you are young, gentle, and obliging. Ah, my dear niece, replied the apparition, my real body is in the tomb, where it will remain unto the resurrection. This one which you see is one miraculously formed of the air to allow me to speak to you, to serve you, to obtain your suffrages. As regards my irritable disposition, seventeen years of terrible suffering have taught me patience and meekness. Know also that in purgatory we are confirmed in grace, marked with the seal of the elect, and therefore exempt from all vice. After such explanation, incredulity was impossible. Who get at once astounded and grateful, received with joy the services rendered during the fourteen days designated. She alone could see and hear the deceased, who came at certain hours and then disappeared. As soon as her strength permitted, she devoutly made the pilgrimages which were asked of her. At the end of the fourteen days the apparition ceased. Leonardo appeared for the last time to announce her deliverance. She was then in a state of incomparable glory, brilliant as a star, and her countenance bore an expression of the most perfect beatitude. In her turn she testified gratitude to her niece promised to pray for her and her whole family, and advised her ever to remember, amid the sufferings of this life, the end of our existence, which is the salvation of our souls.